Good morning. <laughs> Uh, welcome to the Baker Institute. My name is Kirsten Matthews. I'm a fellow in the Center for Health and Biosciences. I want to welcome you here today to hear our distinguished panel. This is part of a discussion that's at the eighth event for our Medicine, Research, and Society Policy Issue Series, which is a joint collaboration between the Baker Institute and the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. And the series is dedicated to educating the public on the important intersection of science, medicine, and policy at the local, state, and national levels. This morning we have a great panel that are gathered here to discuss the impact and prevalence of human papilloma virus and the opportunities in Texas that we have to prevent HPV-related cancers. Uh, before we really begin, I wanted to thank the Baker Institute Health Policy Forum members for their support for the Center of Health and Biosciences, and I also wanted to specifically thank MD Anderson for their continual support of the Baker Institute, our center, as well as this specific program. Uh, to do introductory remarks this morning, we have Dr. Ronald DePino, and many of you probably already know him, but he's the president of MD Anderson Cancer Center, which is one of the top cancer centers in the U.S. and arguably the world, and the Institute's prolific work in basic and translational research in cancer is highly regarded, as well as the research from Dr. Pino himself. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Kirsten. It's uh, great to be here. This is uh, really uh, just a terrific uh, venue. Uh, we've done many collaborations uh, over the years. This is just a great example about how what happens when two great institutions come together to really serve the public. Um, I also want to uh, send out a welcome to one of our newest faculty members. Uh, so Maura Gillison, who I'm, I'm sure many of you know who she is, helped develop this uh, current standard of care for head and neck cancer, HPV-associated cancers in particular. Uh, and she, uh, congratulations, and having just been inducted into the National Academy of Medicine. So it's great to have you in the community. It's another example of CPRIT playing a great role in recruiting uh, the nation's top talent. It's great to have you on the team. So uh, today's topic is one that is uh, critically important. This is just an extraordinary opportunity where science has given us the gift of knowledge of what instigates a whole class of cancers uh, and uh, the means to which to prevent cancers from happening in the first place. You're going to hear a lot about the numbers, but uh, they're quite staggering. We've got 610,000 deaths uh, throughout the world that do not need to occur, about 85% of which occur in very impoverished situations. So the opportunities to apply a safe and effective vaccine uh, is critically important. The numbers are also uh, disheartening here throughout Texas. South Texas, we have an enormous uh, epidemic of cervical cancer. Again, uh, the opportunities for us to apply the knowledge that we have, the opportunities that we have to really change those statistics are uh, before us. And so it's our solemn responsibility as a community as scholars, as institutional leaders, uh, and uh, as healthcare professionals to really drive um, that disease into the history books. And frankly, this is a childcare issue. Uh, if you are an adult, you're HPV infected. And so the seeds are planted early, and so the opportunity exists for us to protect the future health of our children at the right time with the right opportunity uh, so that we can really prevent the disease from happening in the first place and impact pain and suffering uh, for generations to come. Today we're very fortunate to have an august panel uh, that are among the nation's leaders in public health and I'm here to introduce the moderator for today's panel, uh, Dr. Umair Shah. He's the executive director of the Harris uh, County Public Health and the local authority for Harris County. This is the third most populous county in the nation. Uh, he's served many uh, roles, uh, amongst which are a chief medical officer at the Galveston County Health District, uh, an ER doc as well. Um, so he served on the front lines. Um, and he has very deep experience and leadership across state, national, and uh, global public health initiatives having served very influential roles in the Department of State Health Services, Institute of Medicine, CDC, and many other organizations. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Shaw.
Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. DePena, for uh, that kind introduction. Um, the most important thing that I had to do this morning was to have coffee, uh, which I brought up to the stage with me. Uh, for uh, some of you who may be aware of this, uh, my wife and I just had a, a brand new newborn uh, welcome to the family about two weeks ago. And uh, this is my first activity outside of uh, running to get diapers uh, in the last two weeks. Uh, and so I, I did not want to miss this, but I have to be honest that uh, the coffee is the most important thing that I have this morning after the diaper changes in the middle of the night last night. So apologies if I, if I miss anything this morning, but uh, it's, it's great to be here. And, and again, I want to thank Dr. DePena for his leadership and uh, all that MD Anderson does for our community and beyond, because as you know, uh, MD Anderson is such a leader in cancer and neoplasms across the, the globe. And we're very fortunate to have MD Anderson here in our community. So good morning, everybody. Uh, my uh, name is Dr. Umer Shah. I'm the Executive Director of Harris County Public Health, which is the County Health Department here in our community. And for those that are from out of town, uh, we have uh, guests that are uh, here from uh, um, other parts of Texas, but also from other parts of the country. Uh, just to let you know, as Dr. DePino mentioned, we are the third most populous county in the US. Harris County has 4.34 million people, which ranks us somewhere between Kentucky and Oregon as number 27 uh, as a, uh, from a population standpoint as far as states go. And geographically, we're uh, 1,778 square miles, which makes us larger than the state of Rhode Island. Uh, and that's the county alone. And so we're talking about a county that both um, population-wise and geographically is very large. It's also very diverse. It's growing in every sense of the word, and, and we are home to, obviously, an incredible uh, number of institutions at Texas Medical Center, uh, institutions I've been a part of for 15 years. And really, what I would like to say is that there is so much that we need to really be thinking about how do we prevent cancer, how do we take care of cancer before it actually becomes cancer, truly, that we are now in the modes of trying to treat. And Dr. DePino mentioned that this is really a childhood issue, uh, childhood health issue, and I would actually go go one further and say this is also a public health community wide issue. And all of us are here today because we believe in that and we believe it's so important for our community. So Harris County Public Health is, is very committed to this. Uh, we, we certainly know the, the scourge of uh, HPV uh, and the real uh, relationship of HPV on cervical cancer and a number of other cancers. And we really believe very strongly that we need to do our part to work with our medical institutions and all of you in the audience to be able to take care of uh, HPV and really move our community forward. And so with that, I'm very excited to be the moderator for this panel. Um, there are a few things that I'm supposed to be doing. One is to make sure that everybody has their cell phones on, on, on uh, vibrate or silent. Has everybody done that? Yeah? Okay, so if I hear that, ding, 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 it's probably gonna be me. Watch, that's what's gonna happen. It'll be my cell phone that's actually not on, on vibrate. And, um, and number two is that I'm gonna, uh, really, my job is to, to make sure that we stay on time. And so what I'm gonna be doing is to uh, introduce three panelists. Very excited to have three esteemed panelists here uh, that are gonna join me. And each of them are gonna get 15 minutes of, of time to give a presentation, give their perspective, both from a, a national, state, and local vantage point of what's happening with HPV and, and really what are the kinds of things that we can do with HPV vaccine. And then we'll, we'll open it up to some Q&A for all of you. And what I just ask all of you is to really be thinking about your, your questions uh, while the panelists are presenting so that we can queue you up and, and, and uh, be able to spend a few minutes at the very end to, to have that discussion. So I'm gonna start by introducing and first inviting all the panelists to, to come up here. And so uh, we have, um, I'm joined today by Dr. Melinda Wharton. Dr. Wharton, if you wanna come on up. Dr. Wharton is with the Centers for Disease Control Prevention in Atlanta. And Dr. Lois Remendetta with MD Anderson's HPV Associated Cancer Moonshot Program. And finally, Imelda Garcia with uh, Department of State Health Services, the Texas Department of State Health Services Infectious Disease Prevention and Intervention um, Division. So we're very excited to have these three esteemed panelists because the great job about being a moderator is that I actually don't have to know anything. 
So the great news today is that I have experts who are going to answer all the questions. So anything that becomes difficult, I'm either going to punt it back to you and say, well, what do you think about that? Or I'm going to punt it back to these uh, fine individuals and say, well, what do you think about this uh, presentation um, or this question? And so what we're going to do is we're going to give each of our panelists about 15 minutes to, again, provide their perspective. I'm going to introduce, um, I, I've given you the, the very quick introductions for each of them, and you do have more solid uh, introductions and bios in the program. What I'm going to do is just to give you a quick uh, introduction on each of the panelists, and then I'm going to sit down and then let them present and then I'm gonna then come back and um, introduce the next panelist. So our first guest is Dr. Melinda Warden. She's the director of the Immunization Services Division at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta, Georgia. She has more than a decade of experience in vaccine policy and epidemiology. This morning she's gonna discuss the prevalence of HPV, HPV related cancers, and the safety and efficacy of the HPV vaccine vaccine, as well as the CDC efforts, uh, which there have been a number of them, uh, in increasing HPV and HPV vaccine awareness uh, around the country. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Warden. Thanks so much. I, um, I really appreciate the introduction and the opportunity to be here today. We have a tremendous opportunity to prevent cancers, caused by human papillomavirus in young people going forward. Um, for uh, for the, the people who are older than the recommended age for vaccination, for people who are already adults, many people are already infected. And the vaccines that we have are safe and effective vaccines, but they're only preventive vaccines. They only work before people have been exposed to the virus. So it's important that we use them beginning now in young people uh, so that they can be protected going forward. If there were a vaccine against cancer, wouldn't you get it for your kids? Now, it seems obvious that the answer is, of course I would. Where is it? Where do I go get this vaccine? But in fact, that's not really what's happened in the United States. It's, it's been a surprising sequence of events since the first HPV vaccine was licensed in the United States 10 years ago. We have not achieved the, com the coverage that we should have. Uh, uh, this, this slide shows the estimated numbers of HPV-associated cancers attributable to HPV 16 and 18, as well as the five additional types included in the nine-valent vaccine. Uh, in the United States annually. And these are based on data from 2008 to 2012. There's more than 30,000 cases of cancers a year uh, attributable to these, uh, strain, these types of HPV, uh, including um, around 25,000 that are due to type 16 and 18 and the remainder due to the other types. So uh, there's a substantial burden of disease that can be prevented by use of the current nine-valent vaccine. The, uh, just taking one of the cancers, cervical cancer, um, and looking at the, uh, uh, that the rates around the United States, uh, the states that are in darker blue have higher rates. And you can see that uh, a number of southeastern states, including uh, southeastern and south central states, including Texas, are in this darker blue color. Uh, and, and have higher rates than in other parts of the country. Um, almost certainly this has a lot to do with access to services and screening, but uh, it just goes to show that young people in this state can benefit even more than in some other parts of the country uh, from HPV vaccine. Now this is what usually happens when we have a new vaccine that's, routinely, that's recommended for routine use in the United States. Uh, th this graph shows two vaccines, the tetanus diphtheria and acellular pertussis vaccine and the meningococcal conjunct vaccine that were both recommended for routine use in 2006 for children 11 to 12 years of age. And you can see that there were steady increases and after um, five or six or seven years, uh, the coverage leveled off at a high level. We're actually above 80% for both of them now. This is the pattern we usually see when we have a new vaccine recommendation. That's not what happened with HPV vaccine. 
which was recommended for routine use in girls at around the same time. And instead of having that, that steeper trajectory, achieving high coverage levels after a few years, it, it leveled off. And in fact, between 2011 and 2012, there was no increase at all. Now, this, this line, the green line, only shows coverage with one dose. And of course, it's a multi-dose series. So, uh, but the, we assumed we would be able to at least do as well with one dose as we did with these other vaccines, but we didn't. Coverage with three doses in girls uh, was substantially lower. And then later, when the vaccine was routinely recommended for boys, the trajectory's been steeper. And you can see that it's, it's probably going to converge with the, uh, uh, the coverage rate for girls in a year or two. Uh, but we're still, we're still not where we need to be. And of course, coverage with the full three-dose series is even lower for boys. So that's where we are. Now, if we think about what it is that allows a vaccine, vaccine coverage to follow this trajectory. It's, it's not that it automatically happens. I think it's easy for people like me who is, are not taking care of patients every day to underestimate the amount of work that goes into that. But it's really an enormous amount of effort. And it includes motivated and skilled providers who, who know how to deliver immunization services, know how to talk to parents, believe it's important, make the effort to do it. Parents who largely accept immunization and system support, uh, clinical workflows that allow vaccines to be delivered in the clinical setting in the course of routine clinical care. So what does this represent? Well, to some degree, it represents uh, a lack of provider motivation and skill, a vaccine that's seen as not as important or optional or um, a lot of trouble to talk about and deliver uh, discomfort on the part of providers in talking about it some parents who don't accept the vaccine, and barriers in terms of service delivery. Uh, these are data uh, also from the National Immunization Survey, which uh, are the reasons that parents of both boys and girls gave for not vaccinating their child. Uh, four of these reasons suggest that they did not get from their provider a strong recommendation for use of the vaccine that the vaccine was not needed or was not necessary, that their child wasn't sexually active, that they don't know about it, they lack knowledge, or the vaccine wasn't recommended. It seems like all of those could be addressed by a strong recommendation from a provider. It's interesting that safety concerns and side effects uh, is also on this list. And, and that probably is in a different category. Um, it, we can talk more about safety in the question and answer, um, but this is a vaccine that's been in use for 10 years in the United States and around the world. Uh, hundreds of millions of doses of the vaccine have been given, including uh, in a number of countries with excellent immunization safety monitoring capacity. And there are not serious vaccine safety issues that have been identified other than uh, the occasional severe allergic reaction, which can happen with any uh, any vaccine, uh, and, and a, a more common thing, which can result in injury, which is fainting after being vaccinated. But that has to do with getting an injection. It doesn't have to do with this particular vaccine. So the fact that safety concerns remain on this list is uh, actually a little bit surprising and is not a reflection of the safety profile of the vaccine. There's also evidence that providers systematically underestimate the interest of parents in having their children vaccinated. Uh, this is from a study by Mary Healy done here in Houston, uh, where providers were asked to estimate how valuable parents saw different vaccines as being for their adolescent children. And uh, the provider's estimates of the parents' valuation is in the orange bars. Uh, you can see that the providers thought the parents probably thought most of the vaccines were pretty important, less so influenza, and, and much less so for HPV. But when the parents themselves were asked, uh, they un pretty uniformly valued all the vaccines. So the providers underestimated the value the parents placed on them. There, there's also a disconnect between how parents and providers see um, see the systems working to support immunization delivery. This is from a study by Rebecca Perkins and colleagues who, who tried to answer the question 
for kids who have started the series, why don't they finish it? And what, uh, what the parents said, uh, the most common reason was that they expected the clinic to remind them to come back and, and get the second or third dose, while the clinic said that they expected the parents to schedule an appointment. So this is an example of the kind of barriers that can exist in a clinical setting that really make it difficult to complete the series. It's not that they can't be addressed, but they're not necessarily, and there may be appointment systems, for example, that don't allow a return visit to be scheduled four or six months later. So what can healthcare providers do? Well, um, healthcare providers should make a strong recommendation, an effective recommendation for HPV vaccination as cancer prevention for every 11 or 12 year old patient that they see. They should assess vaccine coverage for each provider in their practice and develop an office-wide strategy to improve it. They need to engage the entire practice, not just the healthcare providers, in committing to improve HPV vaccine coverage because everyone who has contact with that family in the office uh, needs to be supporting because otherwise, if they're not, they can really undermine the work the provider's doing. And finally, there are system strategies uh, that can be implemented to help improve HPV vaccine coverage. What do we mean by system strategies? Well, this is from a paper recently published um, by the group from Denver Health in Pediatrics in October, uh, where they reported on their experience in a network of federally qualified health centers in the Denver area on uh, implementing a program to improve HPV vaccine coverage. And what they reported was that they used the uh, immunization, they used their immunization registry uh, to record vaccine history and identify needed vaccines at every visit. The medical assistants checked the registry for recommended vaccines at each visit. They used standing orders for routine immunizations. So there didn't need to be a specific doctor's order for that patient. There was a, a process in place so that a general order was given. They gave the vaccines as early in the visit as possible, so they eliminated the need for the patient to wait around and be observed afterwards. They educated all the providers to present the three recommended vaccines as a standard bundle of adolescent immunizations, not talking about HPV as a separate thing that was different, that makes pa parents believe that it's, it's different and maybe not needed. Uh, they provided provider-level report cards with adolescent vaccine coverage rates. And uh, they also took advantage of school-based health centers to, to deliver vaccines. And this is what they were able to do. Contrast this graph with the one I showed you for the US national data. It also shows their tetanus diphtheria and acellular pertussis vaccine coverage and their meningococcal conjugate vaccine coverage, both of which um, were high a few years after those vaccines were recommended. But they were, have been able to achieve 90% coverage with at least one dose for both girls and boys. And um, this is actually uh, you know, quite remarkable, given uh, the coverage that most places have been able to achieve. Now, their complete series coverage is not quite as high as this, but it's still higher than the Colorado average or the national average. So I think this is strong evidence that these approaches, if implemented together, uh, can result in clinical settings uh, achieving high coverage. But what's it going to take to make that happen for every clinical setting to do the work they need to do to achieve this? And I think it's going to take quality measures. Uh, we have worked with, uh, uh, we have worked to get a HEDIS measure, which has, has been uh, reported for the first time in 2014. And these are data from the 2015 annual report on the quality of care for children in Medicaid and CHIP. You can see that for one dose Tdap and one dose meningococcal vaccine, those two other vaccines we recommend at the same age, uh, for children in the 35 states reporting the mean, the mean coverage uh, by, by age 13 was 65%. For three doses of HPV by thir the 13th birthday in girls, the average coverage was 17%. So there's a long way to go, but with quality measures, we know where we are, and, um, and, it, and it then is possible to improve. So what is it going to take to improve HPV coverage? Well, the provider level interventions I've been talking about are effective, but how do we get them brought to scale? 
It's important, I think, that we continue engagement and coalition building, and that's part of the reason I've been in Texas so many times in the last year or two talking about HPV vaccination. It's important to continue this at the national, state, and local level. But the updated adolescent immunization measure, measure in HEDIS 2017, which now includes both boys and girls, provides an opportunity for systems intervention. At the state level, including state planning efforts to include major health payers and health systems, including Medicaid managed care organizations, and at the national level, including use of quality measures and conversations with national payers and health systems. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Warren, for, for those words. Um, th this um, brings us to our next panelist, uh, uh, who I want to introduce uh, and also thank. Uh, Dr. Remedetta uh, was, was key in our Harris County Public Health collaboration with the Prevent Cancer Foundation in the city of Houston this summer, uh, where we put on a, a, an event to highlight some of the concerns that Dr. Warren, you just brought up in terms of raising the awareness in the bar, and, and particularly in the Asian American community uh, this summer. Um, so Dr. Los uh, Remendetta uh, is from the Department of Gynecologic Oncology at MD Anderson Cancer Center. She's also the chief of the Gynecologic Oncology Division at LBJ Hospital. Uh, she's an expert in cancer treatment and palliative care. Uh, and this morning, she's going to discuss the results of the Texas HPV environmental scan and other regional assessments to improve HPV prevention that was conducted last year. Thank you. Welcome. Okay, well, thank you very much. I'm uh, very excited to be part of this event. Let me see if I can get this to work. Okay, so we've heard a lot of stats, and I don't want to spend too much time on it, but what we really need to realize is that this is a rising problem, that when you compare data from 2004 to 2008 and then 2008 to 2012, HPV-associated cancers are on the rise. And in fact, we expect by 2020, for the most common HPV-related cancer to be that of oral pharyngeal cancer, which occurs mostly in approximately 55-year-old men. Um, what's really impressive about this is that of the 30,000 or so cancers that we've seen over the last year, uh, 28,000 of them are attributable to HPV subtypes that are in the HPV-9 vaccine. This is just, you've seen some of these numbers. These are kind of an example of, of the new cases, specifically in Texas. So these are Texas lives that we can save. And we're excited to be part of this group because it is really about coalition building. What we've really found is that there are a lot of people working in this area, but they're all working in their own silos. What's really important to realize is that prevention works and that we've seen this, and you saw the numbers, we reach 80% on our Tdap and meninge vaccinations and we are able to really reduce the number of deaths that we see related to those vaccine-preventable diseases. We have the potential to do the same with HPV-associated cancers. But we're not doing a great job. Places like Rwanda are doing a great job. 99% of their women get um, the, the full series. In Australia, about 73%. But in the United States, we only hit 42% of girls getting all three doses. And it's only about 28% of boys. And if you look, we are making slow improvements from one to two to three doses, um, but, but not like we'd like to. And I'll just make a note here that hopefully we'll see a big jump this year because as of December, if you get the vaccine on time and you get it before you turn 15, you only need two shots. And so we're gonna see a jump in completion of series just because you don't have to do all three. So what we've done, and, and what I want to kind of talk about a little bit about the scan, but really what we think there's an opportunity for all healthcare centers to do, is do kind of what we're doing with our HPV cancer moonshot. And what that is, is really a targeted approach by bringing together resources, specialists, and attention to an area that we think that we can beat. And so that's what the moonshot is about. And it started slowly. It started with this concept in 2011 we really didn't even totally understand the HPV oral pharyngeal cancer and HPV cervical cancers were connected. And in 2011, we started with a comprehensive cancer control cervical cancer work group where we brought together people from all over the state. And then we moved into, Dr. Sturgis actually started this at MD Anderson, a monthly HPV oral anal genital lecture series because we were all talking about it, but we weren't talking about it together. And then we had this inaugural HPV cancer working group, which was fantastic, and we were really happy to have um, 
uh, Mona Soraya from the CDC there, as well as multiple other uh, physicians, including Doug Lowy, who is now the head of the NCI, and helped us understand what our resources were at MD Anderson and where we could go with this. What we want to see from the moonshot and where we've kind of gone with this is that we believe that we can be part of the effort to remove the cancers from, from the United States as well as from the planet by being catalysts for, for activity, educators, conveners of groups, and policy informers. This is what our moonshot looks like, and I'll explain how we got to this point in a few minutes. But essentially, there are three flagships. Number one is where we call the prevention and screening flagship. And there's a group that I'm in charge of with policy and education, and then Kathleen Schmeller is in charge of screening, bringing low resource opportunities to, uh, uh, to do screening in areas where it hasn't been available before, and to look for new ways to screen for oral pharyngeal cancer, which at this point does not have a screening test. The most common way it's found is when somebody's shaving their neck and they notice a node in their neck, because there are no symptoms, no way to find this. We work very closely with our health policy group, government relations, professional education, and public education. We also have two other groups where we are trying to say, what do these HPV-related cancers have in common? Why do some of the cancers not respond to chemotherapy or radiation? What are some of the molecular differences between these groups? And can we put trials together where we put all the patients in the same basket and look to see if they have responses? So let me talk specifically about why we're here, which is our, our main effort from Flagship One, is to increase HPV vaccination rates, ideally to meet healthy people goal by 2020 of 80%. And I usually put in a little note here and say, I, I hope my job doesn't depend on it, but I'm going to work as hard as I can to get there. This all started, actually, with a great concept from the NCI um, that asked NCI designated cancer centers to get involved because prior to this it was the pediatricians and the family practitioners and, and the health po policy groups trying to figure out how to raise vaccination rates. But the cancer groups weren't involved and so there was a cancer center supplement grant that was offered to say, you guys get involved, find out what the facilitators and barriers are in your areas and how can you raise rates. And we started this in 2014. We were one of 18 centers that received the grant. But what was really crazy is that all the centers that either applied and didn't get the grant or didn't know about the grant, we're excited as well, because this is something that we're seeing the downstream effects of. And um, just to step back, I spend 100% of my time working for MD Anderson at LBJ Hospital, which is a hospital that serves the underserved, and I see new cervical cancer patients every week. I have a 27-year-old in-house right now who is dying from cervix cancer, and it, it's just... It's a pathetic situation that should not happen for so many reasons that we could talk about. So what we did is we, we met people all over the, the state of Texas, from practitioners to health policymakers to people working in federally qualified health centers, and we said, what are the, the facilitators and barriers? And you've really heard them. They really come down to missed opportunities for some reason. Missed opportunities because the appointment wasn't made. Missed opportunities because the doctor didn't know about the fact that anal cancer is 90% related to HPV, or because they didn't realize oral pharyngeal cancer is on the rise, or that boys need to be vaccinated not just to protect their partners, but to protect themselves, or because the patient didn't know, or the parents didn't know. Um, and so that's really what we've been focused on. The, what you see on the left is where we were able to do key informant interviews across the state. Um, you can see those blue areas are very low, um, low populated areas, and many of those people have to get areas in the, in the um, red areas. And then we did a survey as well, and, and those survey responses are seen in the graph on the right. This uh, publication you can find on the Texas Cancer Information website. You can download it. It's, it's got details all across the state. And we were very happy to make many collaborative partners with stakeholders from across the state. And really what we found is, is very similar to the President's Cancel Report. But we have some specific issues in Texas, which we can get into. But one of them has to do with our, our registry and the accuracy of our registry data. What happened after the scan was done is that the cancer centers continued to get together. We first got together in Moffitt in January of 2015, and at MD Anderson, we had our second and, and conclusion of the publications of the scan meeting in 11 of 2015, and a consensus center uh, statement was created, and that's on your tables. And what, that, what we said is that we are tragically underusing 
a safe, effective vaccine. And we as cancer centers recommend that you should do that. We had a third meeting in July of 2016 at Ohio State where we started the work on a second consensus statement, which we hope will be out in December of this year to match up with the MMWR report recommending two doses for people under 15. And there'll be already a fourth one at Hollings Cancer Center. So what we've tried to do as a cancer center is a number of different things, and that's what I'll spend the rest of the time talking about. We call um, our effort an information transfer project. Uh, although there are well-established ways to try to bring this bundled communication lesson, the audit and feedback, uh, the data collection that Dr. Wharton were talking about, we felt that maybe we could offer something different by bringing the cancer specialists to come talk about what it is that we're seeing to the primary care health, health providers. And so we're really doing all those things, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about that, but what we've done is go to the stakeholders that we met during the scan, and we have made uh, le legal agreements to obtain their baseline three-month and six-month data on their, their uh, HPV rates, and look at their clinic flow, review and recommend implement implementation of, of AFIX and American Cancer Society steps, bring them posters, which the health department's been very helpful on bringing to us from the CDC. And we are offering them, although initially we said an 80% goal, we're now aiming for a 20% improvement in their vaccination rate, um, a plaque saying that they are partners in cancer prevention with us. This is where we've been or where we're going. Um, we have uh, already been to Brownsville, where we have some great partners. Corpus Christi has a great partner named Dr. Lori Anderson, a pediatrician who's a great champion. Um, Waco and San Antonio, and we hope to expand this year to Austin, Tyler, Abilene, Laredo, and Amarillo. We also said, you know what, we can't keep doing this if our own house is in order. Let's figure out what MD Anderson employees think. And so we surveyed them in 2015, and we found out we really weren't any better educated than the the lay public, um, which we would have thought since we're seeing the downstream effects of not vaccinating that we would have been smarter. But our response rate was about 21%, which is pretty good. It's about 4,000 people out of 20,000. And what we found is that only about 44% of the girls were fully vaccinated and about 24% of the boys. We did know that the daughters of healthcare providers were more likely to vaccinate a little bit. So that's an interesting thing and an opportunity for us to not only educate the people around us uh, in our communities, but also our staff and the rest of the hospital. Um, we asked them, what were some of the reasons that you don't have vaccinated? And convenience was definitely one of those things that came up and we said so what if we open up a clinic at MD Anderson on Saturdays would you come and so we did about five months ago on Saturdays we opened an employee clinic for employees under the age of 26 or their children we've had it for five months now we have probably about 15 people I think as high as 22 on any particular Saturday morning once a month and we'll intend to do this until we can catch everybody up we will resurvey our people in 2017 because we have spent the last year trying to educate them to the best that we possibly can. We also said it's time to change this sense. Like Dr. DiPino said, if you're an adult, you've been exposed. This is nothing to have a stigma about. This is part of being human. If you can, you can, as I said, you can only hope that your child will have an intimate relationship at some point way down the road. <laughs> um, um, and, and, and you want them to be protected for whatever, you don't know their partners, you don't know their, their marriage history, you don't know anything like that. And so how can we, as a cancer center, put ourselves out of business from seeing HPV-related cancers? Just for, for some background, we did post a Facebook um, um, marketing campaign, and we had to take it down, because although we were prepared for the anti-vax comments, we couldn't keep up. So it did come out as a, a video uh, on, com on commercials, luckily during Olympics, so a lot of people got to see it, and I highly recommend you try to, to look at it because it was really well done with a, a number of different survivors as well as physicians. And then we continue with our Twitter campaign, which seems to be the way of communicating these days. So. Anyway, um, <laughs> survivor mobilization was another option. Oops, sorry, that's my timer. Um, survivor mobilization, how else can we use our survivors to, uh, to get involved? Our survivors are powerful people who have felt like there was a stigma, but now that they know that they can be more outspoken because it affects everybody and we're trying to normalize this, we've been surveying our survivors and we will have our first survivor advocacy training workshop on February 17th. So if you are a survivor um, or maybe even a caregiver of a survivor of any HPV-related cancer, meaning cervix, oral pharynx, specifically tonsil or back of the tongue, penile, anal, vulva or vaginal, we want to see you there because we want to teach you how to tell your story. 
Um, our remaining projects are that we want to continue to be catalysts by helping the other NCI designated cancer centers come up with our second statement. We will continue to help DSHS to work on um, legislation to help understand how to raise vaccination rates in the state of Texas, and we hope that Imelda will at least mention that we will see the results uh, of the, the legislation plan by December 31st. We will work with um, the ACS, on, who is developing, Greg Parkinson is here now, leading a steering committee participation for the state, and we're working with the UT School of Public Health to do some economic modeling on the benefits of vaccinating boys. And then, of course, their faith-based organizations, because for some reason, there's a stigma associated with the possibility of her children having an intimate relationship in their lives at some point. And so um, Dr. DePino has stepped forward and actually went and talked to the Pope about this, and we hope to hear something down the road. Lastly, um, we're re reserving our employees. We'll continue to collaborate. I work in the Harris Health System, and we were happy to say that this year, with con combined effort, we were able to get adult safety net services, which allows us to actually offer the vaccine for 18 to 26 year olds to the uninsured. Um, and then we really hope that through our MD Anderson network, which is 13 states, 26 or so different um, facilities, that we can expand across the country with some of the IT or the information transfer work that we're doing. So lastly, I'll say that this takes an army, not just within MD Anderson, where we've had great leadership from Dr. DePino, but Eric Sturgis, who leads the Moonshot, Mark Moreno and Wesley Duncan from Do Government Relations, and multiple other people, and I have uh, what I call the HPV vaccine dream team who work with me all the time. We work closely with Texas Pediatric Society, CDC, health departments, um, the Harris Health System, and, and we can't do it alone. So we can only encourage us continue dialogue, and I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk. Thank you. So usually I'm the most enthusiastic person in a room, but uh, wow, that's a lot of energy right there that you, you heard. So thank, thank you so much uh, for, for uh, uh, highlighting the incredible work that's happening across the state and, and uh, spearheaded by MD Anderson. Um, so thank you, Dr. Remedetta. Now my uh, distinct pleasure to introduce our final panelist, uh, Ms. Imelda Garcia, uh, one of my colleagues from the Texas Department of State Health Services. She's currently the director of the Infectious Disease Prevention Section. Uh, uh, working to prevent and control communicable diseases in Texas communities. In 2015, the state legislature, as you know, charged uh, the State Health and Human Services Commission uh, with developing a strategic plan for significantly reducing morbidity and mor uh, mortality of HPV-associated cancer. Um, uh, Imelda is going to give us an update on the state of Texas HPV strategic plan and also is going to provide us with some perspectives moving forward. So welcome, Imelda Garcia. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm very happy to be here uh, to talk to you guys. Um, I'm going to talk about a lot of different things. Um, I know the strategic plan is what um, everyone is most interested in. Um, at this point, the plan is still under final review. And so once that plan is finalized and we were able to get it to the state legislature, um, we'll be able to provide um, some public uh, recommendations on that. So um, I won't be able to, to give you too much there. Um, Let's see, there we go. So uh, just to kind of frame some of the conversation today, I'm gonna focus and, and speak a little bit to the Texas-specific data. So Dr. Wharton uh, kind of gave you the national perspective. Uh, Dr. Ramondetta gave you a, a little peek at some of the Texas-specific data. And then from what I really can speak a lot to you today about is really focusing on some of the immunization program activities that we do in order to promote HPV vaccines um, across the state of Texas. So when we're looking at the data sources, uh, we have a handful that we're using. So the NIS, which uh, Dr. Wharton mentioned earlier, the behavioral risk factor surveillance system where we actually uh, call adults and we ask them about the HPV vaccine. And then we took information from our Texas Vaccines for Children's providers and actually pulled what they're ordering. And so um, one of the recommendations is that for that age group, they should be recommending TDA, meningococcal, as well as three doses of HPV. So we pulled their records to actually see how much they're really ordering. Um, you've seen a version of this slide uh, with Dr. Ramondetta, um, just looking at how Texas is doing. You'll see you know, Tdap and Meninge are doing very well, and then as we get into the HPV, uh, we definitely have declining rates um, going down. 
But this next few slides are something that I wanted to highlight because there are geographical differences across the state. Um, and when you look at El Paso, the, the middle section, you'll see they are almost at 80% uh, within the first dose administered to, to females. Um, Dr. Shaw, Houston, you guys are close. Um, at uh, almost 67%. Um, and then you can see you know, where we are compared to the overall state and then looking at Bear County um, where we obviously have a little bit more work to do, um, but a lot of opportunities for improvement um, in different areas. Here's a snapshot where we're looking at poverty status as well as race and ethnicity um, and some of the differences. You'll notice that actually for those uh, children that are um, individuals below the poverty level, they actually have higher vaccination rates than those above, um, both for the female and the males. Um, when you look at the race and ethnicity disparities, you'll see that Hispanics actually have a higher take up rate of the vaccine um, compared to the other groups. And then here's just a breakdown from the Briffis survey. So again, this is adults being asked about the HPV vaccine um, and their coverage rates. This one is actually, this next slide is one that I think is really, really important. Um, Dr. Wharton spoke about you know, providers really pushing and recommending the vaccine. We have about 3,600 uh, vaccines for children's providers across the state. Uh, we do on-site quality assurance visits to each of those providers. And when we're out there, we actually ask them um, specific questions about the HPV vaccine and, and their practice, and we ask them how they think they're doing. And nine times out of 10, the provider will always tell you, we're doing great, I'm really working at it, I'm promoting it, you know, we should have really stunning numbers. Um, and what our former commissioner used to tell us is always show me the data. So what does the data say? Um, so when we looked at what they were actually ordering, again, looking for that three to one ratio, um, we have improved over the past several years. But when you look at by jurisdiction, you'll see El Paso is the closest one at two to one uh, compared to that of the uh, city of Houston, Bear, and El Paso. Um, in Hidalgo County. So when the, in actual practice, how is it actually resulting in the doses being administered and being ordered? And so this was a, um, a way for us to really engage the provider, to l talk to them about opportunities to kind of you know, change some of their behavior, help support them in, in providing uh, the vaccine recommendations. So a little bit about the strategic plan. Um, we have a, a couple of different things that I'll talk about. Um, Senate Bill 200 was passed the last legislative session. Um, it was part of a, a big, uh, a very big bill. Um, a part of that directed uh, Health and Human Services, the Department of State Health Services, and the Cancer Prevention Research Institute of Texas, or CPRIT, to develop this report. Um, the next couple of bullets just highlight some of the direction that we were given. So specifically to identify barriers to prevention, screening, and treatment of HPV cancers, identify methods other than a mandate uh, to increase the number of people vaccinated for HPV, and then there's a whole host of other uh, specific uh, direction that they, receive, that they give us. But the most, the most important one is for us to make recommendations to the state legislature in order to uh, propose policy changes as well as any funding recommendations. Um, we did host a public hearing earlier this summer where we solicited a lot of feedback. Um, Dr. Ramondetta and MD Anderson have played key stakeholders in, in helping us uh, write that report. Um, and we are due to uh, submit to the legislature later this month. So um, once the information becomes uh, finally approved, we will be promoting the release of it. We'll share it with all of our uh, stakeholders that helped draft it, as well as uh, some of the other community stakeholders. So stay tuned on that one. Um, part of our targeted intervention with TVFC was sharing their provider ordering, and we did that through a letter that we send them out. We started doing this about in 2015, and um, we got really uh, strong remarks, and we actually saw some of uh, increases in HPV vaccinations once we started showing them what their actual ordering practices were. But part of that was also providing the tools and recommendations along with how to improve their practice and how to strengthen some of those components. Um, and so now it's part of our routine. Now we do it every six months and we share that with them. Um, and we're, we're able to kind of track and see how each individual provider and each clinic is doing as a whole. 
several years ago, we actually developed an HPV toolkit, um, really targeting for healthcare providers, not only uh, the physicians, uh, physician assistants and nurses, but also for school nurses who may not be giving vaccines, but who are a key component in, prom in promoting the vaccine. Um, trying to really help them find easy ways to improve the vaccination rates, kind of the, really focusing on evidence-based uh, interventions that Dr. Wharton talked about in order to really help improve some of those changes. And then one of the things that I actually really love about our program is they've done some really phenomenal work on the communications front. Uh, we started doing a public awareness campaign by doing uh, some research and doing focus groups to really look at what were uh, some of the attitudes. Um, with that, we took that information and really helped hone some of our, our messaging, figuring out what was gonna make the biggest impact within uh, the target groups that we're trying to find. Um, so between that, we developed TV and radio ads. Some of you may have heard them. Uh, we usually have a, a large push in the fall. Uh, did a lot of online marketing and then have uh, some posters out for provider health clinics. And then here's just uh, an example of the, the Spanish and English posters for you guys to see. And the last one I'll show you is this little clip. Um, this is one of our uh, videos uh, that we play on TV. Some of you may have seen the, the ads um, in recent, let's see. They told me I just had to push, I don't know, this one. Nope. Nope. I may need some help here. There we go. There you go. Honey. I'm fine. Okay? There's no vaccine for her drama, but there's one for HPV that helps prevent cervical cancer. Ask your doctor. So for anybody that has kids, I think you can relate to the attitude, <laughs> particularly those with teenagers. Um, but this was just an example of uh, a couple of the media campaigns that we've done, and we have continued to run um, them over the past couple of years as we've gotten some really great feedback from them. And we have shared them with, uh, with the CDC and some other states um, because uh, they seem to like how clever it is and um, you know, it really catches everyone's attention. So um, that's just a snapshot of some of the stuff that our immunizations program is doing. As I mentioned, uh, we will have more information specifically related to the new strategic plan once it's been approved and, and we've shared that with leadership. Um, so I look forward to uh, sharing that information with you guys at a later time. Thank you, Melda. Uh, fantastic as always, so great job with that. Um, and she reminded me as did uh, Dr. Uh, Remedetta about the fact that we do have a hashtag uh, for this event. It's uh, hashtag Baker HPV. So for those of you in the spirit of Twitter and social media, if you wanna raise the awareness, this is your opportunity to get the word out to the rest of the, the community um, and the world, right? So Twitter is global, right? So yeah, so you got <laughs> six billion people you can reach today right now just by <laughs> tweeting so do you can please take care of that um, so I want to first of all thank our three panelists if you can join me again in, in thanking them for their excellent presentation and also the fact that uh, to a T all three of them actually finish not just on time but actually a minute early each one of their panels. So they gave you three minutes back. So this is incredible. This is a lot of incredible amount of coordination and choreography that you, the three of you did. So thank you very much for that. So now the, the, the good part of this is that we have uh, plenty of time uh, for questions and answer. We have uh, about 20, I'm looking at Mark, 20, 25 minutes. Yeah, uh, about 20 minutes for some uh, Q&A, and uh, I know you have a ton of questions for these panelists, and I do want to remind you again of the uh, disclaimer I gave at the very beginning, which is, I'm not the expert, they are. Any question you ask, I'm going to either throw it back to you or I'm going to throw it to them, and that's my job as the moderator today, so uh, here we go. And with that, um, why don't we, do we have microphones that are floating around? We've got some hands that are going up. Uh, 
Hi. <laughs> this is for Dr. Horton, please. Um, going back to the map of the United States that we were looking at. And if you can just, excuse me, just to introduce yourself. Oh, well. I'm sorry. Yeah, My you. name is Linda McBride. I'm just someone from the public who was invited. Um, going back to the map that you showed us, I noticed that I thought the state of Wyoming was in dark blue, and it was kind of all by itself out there, and I just wondered, since it's not a state that's densely populated or has large cities, if you, could, if you have any idea why that was. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know that I can address Wyoming specifically, but with cervical cancer, um, if there is access to care, access to screening, and early intervention, women hopefully will not go on to develop cancer, even if they're infected, have persistent infection with a high-risk type. So I assume that what that map reflects is access, taking either having access to screening services or taking advantage of screening services. Do you want to add anything to that? No, I mean, that's, that's why we're in the dark blue. I mean, we have a high number of uninsured, despite marketplace insurance, and, uh, and also a lot of people who enter the country and get care here and don't have access to screening services, which just for the public's information, there's plenty of access. It's really trouble navigating that access. That's the big problem. Great. Over here. My name is Allie Dom. I'm a uh, physician currently practicing in the Houston and surrounding area, and I was wondering what is the recommendation for the patients that have already received the bivalent or quadrivalent vaccine in regards to the nine valent vaccine? Do we give them an additional three doses? Do we give them one or two? Uh, thank you for that question. Um, so the, the original vaccines that were licensed in the United States included either four or two types of HPV. They both included the 16 and 18, which are the most uh, common cancer-causing types. Um, but there's a new nine-valent vaccine that includes five additional types. So there's some additional coverage for additional types of HPV with the vaccine that's currently available. Uh, there, there is not a recommendation to revaccinate people who've already completed a series with either the four-valent or the two-valent vaccine. Um, you know, individuals who decided they were interested in doing that um, could talk to their doctor about it. It would be off-label, but it, it, you know, pr providers can administer vaccines off-label. Uh, but we don't have a recommendation to do it at this point. And I'll just make a comment. I usually say I have two daughters. I have a 19-year-old who is vaccinated with the four-valent, and I have a 10-year-old who will be vaccinated with the nine-valent. Um, for cervix cancer, you're protecting about 70% of the cause of cervix cancer with either of the other two, the, the ones that only protected 16 and 18 infections. You really increase that to about 85% protection against cervix cancer with the nine-valent. So you do get a significant improvement, and you should use that in the future. But I'm not actually going to revaccinate my 19-year-old, most likely because she would never let me do that to her. But, um, <laughs> but, but uh, it is a personal choice. And 16 and 18 were in all three vaccines. And that will make it simple for everyone, because by the end of this year, it's going to be the only one that we have. So. So I have a good question for you around um, trying to really get to that 80% coverage uh, rate. Um, where do you see mandates or no mandates or pretty please mandates? I mean, well, where, do, where do we see the real role of mandates in, in a state like Texas and communities like ours? Do, do you see this as an important piece for us to really be able to get to that 80% that attainment rate? Who is that question for? Um, <laughs> How about all three? <laughs> well, so from CDC's perspective, mandates are a state decision. Um, the decision makers in states are the people who have the responsibility to make those decisions. And I think what among the things they consider are uh, how well can you do without the mandate, what's the additional benefit, and what are the risks. And there are some risks of opening up school immunization requirements. Um, it, you, may, you may be able to strengthen them, uh, but, but also you, they may be loosened if, if the requirements are opened up. So uh, I think that's a decision that states make thoughtfully and carefully. Uh, practically speaking, s states have mandates already for the tetanus, diphtheria, acellular pertussis vaccine, and many states also for meningococcal conjugate vaccine. So the kids already have mandatory vaccines that they're going to the doctor to get. 
the year that the mandate applies, whether it's sixth grade or seventh grade, or wh whatever age they are, when the mandate applies. And so with the child in the office, there's a chance to deliver the mandated vaccines as well as the recommended vaccines, and that's a, um, a strategy that can be really effective. I'm, just, I'm yeah. going to make one comment on that, just that that's part of the education aspect for the providers is, uh, you know, it's one thing for the families to understand about mandated versus not, and they may come in with that idea, but it's very important that the providers don't separate that out because as providers, we recommend all three of those vaccines equally. That's standard of care. All of the government, the ACIP, the AAP, the TAFP, all those people recommend the vaccines equally, and we've already seen that more deaths are caused by HPV-related cancers than those other vaccine preventable cancers and so it's it's important that the the providers are taught how to communicate that to the patients who may suggest that they they only want the mandated ones so, so you have um, a, a an opportunity a strategic opportunity when when a patient or their child gets to uh, the provider for that provider now to be able to to really talk through some of those yeah, you should never even choices. mention it it's it's very much about this bundled presentation hi Jack is due for their vaccines today we'd like to give them Tdap HPV and meninge vaccine do you have any questions which arm would you like it in and then they say <laughs> and then they say but I only want the mandated ones well you can explain that that is a government decision and that as a provider I recommend all three equally uh, and that we have a chance to prevent to I, I feel very strongly about preventing cancer in your child as I'm sure you do as well and and we'd like to I'd like to tell you some of the things I know about the vaccine. Well, I want you to be our doctor. Is that possible? <laughs> That's great. That's great. Imelda, did you have anything you want to add to that? Um, well, given that we're the state health department, our mandate is to implement whatever state laws are enacted by the legislature. And so, um, you know, whatever the state legislature wishes us to implement, we will implement. Um, but from the, the national CDC um, federal funds that we have, we're charged with increasing immunization rates rates across the board. So um, the other ones that are not rec you know, required for school entry are, is the flu vaccine. And so you know, we constantly have a push um, to increase vaccination rates across all ACIP recommended vaccines, across all um, kids, whether they are uh, vaccinated with our vaccine, with the federal vaccine, or with um, private insurance vaccine. So ours is a, a much more trying to take a, a, an eagle's eyes perspective and increase immunization rates across the board. Um, with whatever tools that we are allowed to use within the state health department, we will use that what's in our toolbox. Um, and at this point, um, the mandate is not within our toolbox. But should they change, then obviously we would go in that direction. Great. So. Very well said. Um, I believe the microphone is in the, oh, it's right here. Gentlemen, please identify yourself. My name is Sterling Miner and I too. I'm a a person that's in the Baker Institute Roundtable who comes to many of these. Uh, Dr. Wharton mentioned uh, the vaccine in the context of the uh, primary health care provider. And my question is, is there serious consideration being given to making the center of vaccinations being the Walgreens and yeah. CVSs and Kroger's uh, of America rather than uh, the public health office or right. the physician office. Sure, that's a that's a great question, Dr. Warden. And, yeah, and that, we'll turn that it over to you. That is a great question, and that's another issue that really is decided at the state level in terms of what is the scope of practice that's allowed in individual states for pharmacists to deliver immunizations. Uh, I think in every state or almost every state, pharmacists are allowed to give some vaccines to somebody under some circumstances. It may require a prescription. Uh, it may be just adults. It may be just flu vaccine. But, but with the H1N1 pandemic, I think we really nationally all saw the value of having additional locations for immunization services to be delivered. Uh, it's really, it seems to really be an important adjunct to, adjunct to delivery in the, in the clinical setting, in the office setting, uh, for adult immunizations, along with workplaces, where lots of adults get vaccines in a lot of different places, in their work sites, and at pharmacies in those states that allow it. Now, um, there's, I think people generally are more ambivalent about the younger individuals we're talking about in terms of whether or not it's appropriate to give those in pharmacies. 
Um, I think the idea of having Walgreens of vaccinating infants, maybe that doesn't feel like the right thing to do. But um, vaccinating adolescents or preteens at 11 to 12, you know, maybe that's okay. And some states allow it. Um, I think that the pediatricians uh, really strongly feel that immunizations to children are best delivered within the context of the medical home. But in some places where there's access or capacity issues, could it be helpful if the pharmacist could deliver the second or third dose? Well, m maybe so. Um, the, the pediatrician could have the initial conversation with the family, start the series, and then maybe they could, could uh, complete the series um, you know, at, at the Kroger Pharmacy. Um, again, this is a matter for individual states depending on, on what their scope of practice allows, but those conversations are going on in a lot of places. So thanks for that question. Yeah, it's a great question. You know, I, I think the other thing to just point out is that there, there's so much that's changing in the in the um, healthcare delivery landscape, and so we really need to continue to to stay ahead of it, abreast of it, and also be partnering in a in a very non traditional sense of where healthcare delivery is being delivered, as Dr. Wharton has just mentioned. That's a great question. In the back. Hi. My name is Julia Jiang. I'm a reporter with the uh, New Town Dynasty Television channel, local channel 51.4. And uh, I read that this vaccine is highly effective. But I just wonder how you get the data, because the vaccine has out been like uh, 10 years, and uh, you were given it to like 12 years old. And why one would imagine that at age 22, you don't get cancer. So how do you know that it's actually preventing cancer? Yeah, I'll, uh, uh, I'll, Dr. Warden, and then. Uh, yeah, and, and you, can, you, can, yeah. you can fill in. Uh, thank you. That is a great question. Uh, we have several lines of evidence that demonstrate the effectiveness of the vaccine post-licensure. Uh, the first one is there are good data on the um, a pretty immediate impact on reduction in genital warts. Um, there's studies from both Australia and the United States where the four-valent vaccine was used initially, which includes type 6 and 11, which cause genital warts, uh, which don't have this long lag time before they appear after infection. So we've got direct evidence for effectiveness uh, against genital warts as an outcome. There's also evidence that the vaccine prevents infection with types 16 and 18. Uh, there's been a number of studies that have demonstrated that. We see that in our National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey data that CDC has analyzed, which shows a very dramatic reduction in the prevalence of infection in the youngest women who are included in that survey um, who have been vaccinated. So that's another source type of evidence. And then there's evidence about the um, precancerous cervical abnormalities in young women who've been vaccinated. Um, I've seen studies from both Australia and the United States. There's probably others as well. Where we're not talking about cancer, but we're talking about cervical intraepithelial neoplasia type two or three, where, where we know given the natural history of persistent infection with these high-risk types of HPV, there's then um, more and more abnormalities that occur before eventually cancer occurs, which is the, the whole basis of our screening and early intervention approaches to cervical cancer. And there is enough time that's passed that we can see the impact on CIN2 and CIN3. So we've got multiple lines of evidence that support the effectiveness of the vaccine as it's been be, as it's being used post licensure. Do you want anything to that? No, I mean I think that's a great question. We had talked before that 80% of people are exposed at some point in their lifetime, but if you take a group of people in their teens, about a quarter of them at any one time are going to have HPV. And what we've been able to see is that um, in that vaccine eligible group, already we can drop the HPV prevalence rate, the number of people who have the infection, by about 60 to 70 percent. Um, and that's just in those who've been vaccinated. And then just to clarify, it's, it's the infection is right away. The warts happen within a couple months, and then the dysplasia happens in about three to five years after exposure. There's also some data that shows that you can decrease the oral HPV infection rate. Now, that general population rate is only somewhere between 5 and 15 percent, depending on the age of the person that you're looking at. But we've already seen in the Costa Rican data that that rate decreases. So we have 
a lot of scientific fact showing that the vaccine works. And we have 10 years of data. And at this point, it appears to be just as effective at 10 years as it was initially. Right. So <clears throat> we just talked about evidence, data, and raising awareness. Um, and we also know the, the, the issue that all three of you have touched on, the health equity issue, uh, that there are communities in our larger community that regardless of what we've done thus far, we have not been able to penetrate and reach to the levels that we need to reach. What are you, do you see as those strategies that we can reach some of these communities that unfortunately are not sharing in these vaccination rates that we would like to see across our, our larger community? How, how would you, and that's a question obviously for all three of you. And we can start with Imelda, and why don't we move uh, okay. this way? Um, I think at this point, it really takes a lot of involvement at the community level. Um, we've seen a lot of really uh, positive results out of coalition building um, across different cancer types. Um, when you see a momentum and you focus on the prevention piece, um, vaccines as a cancer prevention is kind of a new idea um, for the general public. And I think that um, if the community itself embraces it and showcases how important important it is for cancer prevention, um, particularly because I think everybody knows somebody in their family or their friend that has had cancer and how devastating not only the disease but the treatment can be as well. Um, and if you're able to harness that and really you know, message at the local level, because we can talk all the time at, at the state from Austin, mm -hmm. it, but it's whether or not the individuals in the communities at the local level are, are really interested into hearing it. So. I'm going to just emphasize that um, it's not necessarily uh, the underserved that are not getting vaccinated. The underserved are not getting screened, um, but actually uh, from some of the slides that we saw, some of the minority patients actually have better vaccination rates. And part of that is related to programs like the Vaccines for Children program, which does a great job of coming in and saying you're due for three vaccines and kept finding these um, children in school-based clinics in some cases, which is why many other countries in the world have great vaccination rates, because they do it there. Um, and in fact, our biggest issue are sometimes um, those patients who have insurance who believe that their child is not ever going to be at risk for this. So profiling is bad. Um, and, uh, and, and so I think that it's important to recognize, and that's why Australia has that not perfect rate, because they are missing out on some of their indigenous population as well. Uh, so it, it's, it's a matter of kind of getting, getting people who have access to care, but it's oftentimes the people who are seeing the doctors and, are, and it's a doctor-patient communication issue. And there is a, definitely a lot of doctors who profile their patients and say, my patients aren't at risk, I'll get them when they're 16. Um, I saw a great slide, uh, Joe Rourke from the CDC showed us a slide uh, at a recent presentation we did uh, showing uh, Sandra D from Greece at the beginning of the summer and at the end of the summer. <laughs> and they suggested that it's very important that you don't profile people, because a lot can happen in one summer. <laughs> Dr. Ward. Uh, well, in, in addition to community involvement and really um, I, trying to make sure that all providers make that strong recommendation to all of their patients and not just the ones they think are at risk, whatever that means, uh, I, I think that, that probably the, the I think it's probably going to be really important to engage health systems and for health systems to take this on as something that matters to them and that they're going to evaluate performance for in order for us to get there. I think going one family at a time or one doctor at a time is just going to take too long. I think we've got to do this in big groups of physicians and big groups of, of families that are receiving care within those health systems. Um, the, that's part of the reason I think the Denver Health example that I showed in my presentation is so nice because it shows what a health system can do when they actually implement the evidence-based strategies that we know from experience with other vaccines are effective and that they work with this one too. You just have to do it. 
And getting that information out is, is what's difficult. I mean, it's, it's, I always tell the medical students, it's really sad when you graduate and you realize that you have to keep reading. You're, you didn't learn everything that you needed to know. Um, there are great places to get updated information. The CDC Adolescent Teen website is one of those. And another one that's been trying to put this together is the American Cancer Society has a, a space called the Clearinghouse where they have collected data from all the major professional groups with slides and videos, videos of survivors, things that you can download for free and that you can use. And it's really, at this point there, this year, the goal is to figure out from the, the round table how to get that information out to other people. Uh, thank you. Uh, did you Okay, uh, and I want to thank uh, Greg, uh, Jennifer, and Ruth for um, tweeting uh, and retweeting. So I'm watching, and I'm actually tweeting while we're up here. So <laughs> if you guys don't know, remember hashtag is uh, Baker HPV. So I'm watching what you're doing in that virtual world as well. And uh, we have uh, time for just uh, one or two more questions, and then. Um, and then we're gonna wrap up. So please identify yourself. Hi, my name is Farhan Majid. I'm a fellow here at, uh, my name is Farhan Majid. I'm a fellow at the Baker Institute, uh, work on global health. Uh, I have a question about uh, what platforms do you think or the mechanisms have been most cost effective in reaching out to the public? Like, do you think the TV ads have been somewhat more effective versus the online platforms? What is the role of, for example, kind of using cell phones and like, like messaging, for example, directly to people? I'm just curious about it. I think the, the media campaigns do a very good job about getting it on your brain. But whether or not you remember that when you're in the clinic with your kid or for yourself, and that's really um, when the provider have making sure the provider brings it up with you. Um, and that's a piece that whether it's the school nurse sending out flyers to all the kids, you know, for what the school requirements are and, oh, you know, here's information on that. Um, it, you can't go with just one avenue. Right. So just having it, you know, ha, that's a funny, you know, commercial. But whether or not that convinces a parent um, to actually talk to their, so if their doctor didn't recommend it, well, hey, I know about this other one. How come you didn't mention that one type of thing? Um, and so that's the piece that you really have to have a multifaceted approach. You know, we can spend 10, 20 million dollars on media campaigns, that, but that may not move the needle at all. Um, and so that's part of the reason why um, having the grassroots from the community level, focusing, having targeted um, outreach and working with providers so that they know what they're actually doing. So I think I'm doing really great at recommending, but I'm not keeping up with the pace that I should be. Um, and providing some of that real uh, tangible things that uh, clinicians can do when they're actually sitting face to face with the patients. I think that's the, probably the biggest thing that we can do. So. Yeah, I think earlier it was said that um, um, it takes a, uh, an army mm -hmm. and uh, we always say it takes a village. And uh, we're really seeing at our health department that, that really um, oftentimes it's healthcare systems and healthcare delivery, but it really health happens where you live, learn, work, worship, and play. So we're really trying to look at strategies of how do we get in the community and not just be thinking about how the community comes to us, but how do we get into the community where people are. And I think that's one of those ways. And then certainly social media and other mainstream media are, are really key elements of this. Um, Dr. DePinia. Uh, Melinda, I really like your idea about healthcare systems and having this be a really important quality measure and having us uh, really uh, mm -hmm. be responsible in that regard as a system. I, I want to ask a really provocative question here, which is that given the overwhelming weight of the evidence that this is really best practices, uh, and now that we have a safe and effective vaccine that clearly prevents these cancers. Uh, do you think that we'd reach a point where this would be medical malpractice mm -hmm. if somebody, you think, you know, let's say a 20, your, your, your patient that you talked about for which, you know, the vaccines existed, that they have the virus that could have been prevented and there's documentation that there was no recommendation for, you know, the, that the patient had gotten the appropriate pediatric visits and so on and so forth, uh, would a case be mounted that would be successful from a legal standpoint that this would essentially be the equivalent of not recommending colonoscopy or mammograms, et cetera, 
for individuals that ultimately go on to develop the disease. Well, I'm not a lawyer. Um, I was going to say, which attorney on the panel are we going to direct that one to? <laughs> but, but your point, uh, but, I mean, I agree with your point. This is the standard of care. And I think healthcare providers who don't provide medical care that meets the standard of care, if something bad happens to their patient, that's a hard thing to defend. So, um, it, I mean, I, I do think that in the communication with, there, you know, there are some providers who just aren't using HPV vaccine. They're just not using it. And to, uh, to make the case to those providers that they're not providing care that meets the standard of care is a very straightforward thing to do because they're not. That's what I usually say when I, when I go out to patients. If I have a 60-year-old in my clinic who's been there for the last 10 years and she's diagnosed with breast cancer or, col or colon cancer and I hadn't recommended the screening test or at least documented that I recommended it, then technically I feel like I'm liable. And that's one of the reasons, one of the things that we're launching in the next few weeks is we uh, made an epic smart set um, for at least our prevention and pediatric department to start using that we'll be able to track that something has been recommended. And so the prevention department will be recommending recommending it, and it's just a quick way of saying, I've recommended this vaccine to the to this parent um, because of the following risks, and they have chosen to do this or not do this, depending on, on how it comes out. So we have time for one last question, and uh, the person with the microphone, I think, is going to be able to get that last question, so you're up. Okay. Hi, my name is Caitlin Cherry. I'm a research technician here at Rice in the bioengineering department. Um, I have a question for Dr. Raman Detta. Um, during your presentation, you showed a slide with countries and their HPV rates, and Rwanda was 99%. Mm -hmm. I found that fascinating. What Do you know what I they're doing? I may actually have Dr. Wharton comment on that, but there are countries that are below a certain economic level that, are at, that have access to vaccines through a program called GABI, and that is something that Rwanda had access to and launched a, a, net, a countrywide campaign. Yeah, and, and they delivered it in schools to girls and were able to achieve very high coverage. Um, Australia and the United Kingdom also have done school-based immunization uh, with launch of their programs and were able to achieve much higher coverage than we did. That is an advantage of having a um, integrated health system uh, where you're not relying on this mix of private and public funders to cover vaccinations. It's much more difficult for us to do school-based vaccination uh, because of the fragmentation in, in our healthcare system. And, uh, you know, I, I think there are some things that we certainly can learn from our global uh, community partners across uh, whether it's PAHO or WHO and, and other in-country uh, folks, and I know CDC is doing a number of initiatives across the globe, so, so fantastic. Um, well, I want to, I mean, we can go on actually, because I know there are five or six other hands that have come up. Um, I know we can go on for longer, but I think it's in the interest of time, we're going to go ahead and conclude the program. And I just want to thank everybody. Um, also to remind everybody that we have a new administration coming in. Uh, I don't know if anybody knows that. <laughs> Anybody heard? Okay, so you're aware of that. A new administration coming in at the federal level. Um, we have the Texas legislature that's going to be starting up in just a matter of several weeks. Uh, and so we're going to have a lot of things that are happening at a federal level, as well as things that are going to be happening at a statewide level. And so certainly I, I know HPV and, and other vaccine preventable diseases are going to be at the forefront of discussions. And, and our job is to really continue to get the word out for that. I want to thank all of you for your fantastic uh, participation today and for your attention. Uh, this has been incredible. Um, I feel like I've learned a lot and I um, didn't have to use too much coffee, so that was good in the process. I want to thank Dr. DePino for introducing uh, all of us uh, this morning. I want to thank the Baker Institute. I want to thank MD Anderson. I certainly want to thank all the sponsors here this morning. And I really want to conclude by thanking our three panelists. If you can join me again in welcoming uh, their, or thanking them for their incredible uh, thoughts and contributions this morning. <laughs> and with that, we are concluded. Thank you so much.